Thank you, Frank, for that introduction. And uh, I'm, I was involved in the international trade of germs on the airplane. So two young children sitting next to me, they were so cute. I had to play with them, and you can see the result. I'll try my best. Uh, and I have interesting slides, so you can ignore me speaking and just look at the slides. <clears throat> First of all, as was mentioned, I work at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and we are heavily involved in the SDGs, as you can imagine. Um, like the WTO member countries, we have over 190 member countries who are also interested in these issues of uh, environmental, social, and economic pillars for sustainable use, and also it, its um, importance in producing uh, food, not for this current generation, but for all generations. So let me start uh, by talking about um, the subject of uh, fisheries standards and eco-labels. I have to start by saying that despite the adoption of a code of conduct for responsible fisheries in 1995, uh, by the FAO member countries and the progress that it has brought, not all fishing activities are conducted in a responsible or legal manner. Some fishers do not respect fishing rules undermining responsible management and trade. As you know, the problem of the commons with marine capture fisheries and also inland capture fisheries is its open access and the private optimum fishing effort it's not equal to the social optimum. So there needs to be some kind of uh, regulation or property rights or quotas involved in the fisheries. And if some fishers do not respect those rules, they undermine uh, others' actions. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUU fishing, it can occur on the high seas, the exclusive economic zones of countries, or in inland fisheries like lakes in Africa. It has increased significantly over the last two decades. Uh, some high-value marine species have reached major levels, namely uh, swordfish and tuna. These activities can occur even under flags of noncompliance or flags of convenience. So it doesn't matter that we have all these binding instruments for regulating capture fisheries. We have non-binding guidelines and instruments if people aren't following the rules, um, if some people are managing the resources responsibly, either domestically or through regional fisheries management organizations, but others are not, then the resource is not sustainable globally. If we look at production and utilization of fisheries, and this includes aquaculture, we can see the blue line is flat. We've maxed out on capture fisheries contribution to production and utilization. Whereas aquaculture has been increasing, although at a decreasing rate. What this implies is that we have to do something with our resources. If we're over utilizing fisheries, then this line will eventually go down. So we have to make sure that we manage our capture fisheries sustainably and also find innovative ways to increase uh, aquaculture's contribution to human food security. Unfortunately, the capture fisheries sector is already under stress from overexploitation. We also have ocean pollution, and we're doing studies now on the incidence of plastics in the ocean. You've all heard of that floating island, um, and also oil spills. There's declining biodiversity, expansion of invasive species, which happens primarily due to climate-induced changes. And also climate change and ocean acidification are things that are going to affect that curve and what we can produce from our oceans. The share of marine fish stocks that are overfished that we've estimated at FAO has increased from 10% in the 1970 to nearly one-third in 2011. So we've reached our limit with fishing and overfishing. I might want to mention that a model of fish to 2030 that was done jointly uh, between the FAO and OECD uh, came up with estimates of what we need for consumption by 2030. And they came up with a 50 million ton fish gap so what's going to be demanded in 2030 
by population growth and income growth, which changes tastes and preferences for, for more fish, um, is going to result in a gap. And we're hoping that technological innovation and aquaculture will take that up, but it wouldn't hurt to sustainably manage capture fisheries, both inland and marine, in the meantime. For sub-Saharan Africa, owing to a population growth in the model of 2.3% per year, it's estimated that sub-Saharan Africa will increase its demand for fish for human consumption by 30% by 2030. As its production is projected to expand only marginally, the regions dependent on fish imports will rise from 14% in 2000, the base of the model, to 34% in 2030. So we can see that trade is also important in fisheries. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side, you can see fish, the right-hand column, is the most highly traded food commodity. So among all agricultural crops, fish is the most highly traded, and it's been increasing. And the value chains of fish have been becoming more and more complicated. You can have fish that are caught in one country, shipped to another for processing, shipped to another for canning, and then finally shipped to another country for consumption. It's a very complicated value chain. Echo labels for sustainable sourced seafood evolved primarily as a means to use market power of the most highly traded food commodity to promote sustainable fisheries management. Market access was to be a reward to fisheries managed sustainably according to the certifier's criterion. These market-based measures initially reflected the goals of civil society and consumer groups in the industrialized importing countries who believe fisheries were not being adequately managed by their governments. So market-based measures using market power and buying power of consumers and these NGOs was thought of as another way to try and push for sustainable management. The first private seafood certification scheme was established in 1997 as a joint project between the largest seafood buyer, and here we should point out that the seafood traders and buyers and importers and exporters, they want seafood to continue in the future. They're not, they don't have business plans that end in five years. They're looking for long-term investments, so they're also concerned about availability of the resource and an international nonprofit organization. Since then, there has been a proliferation of private voluntary certification schemes. Operating in the seafood market, and each one has different goals and principles and criteria, and they all fill different niches in the marketplace. Given the uptake of seafood echo labels in the major importing markets, and we're talking here about United States, European Union and Japan, who import the majority of products. Governments have become increasingly concerned that these certification, voluntary certification schemes are interfering with their fisheries management and actively, use, and actively deemed, a, which are actively deemed the responsibility of governments, either at the national level in the economic zones and inland fisheries or the regional fisheries management organizations, which have member countries. Members of the FAO Committee on Fisheries, as I said, we have over 190 countries, requested FAO to develop international guidelines for echo labeling of fish and fishery products from capture fisheries, inland fisheries, and aquaculture. And this followed an intense expert debate and expert consultation with FAO members and other stakeholders in academia, NGOs, private companies. And these certification guidelines were finalized in 2009 for marine, 2010 for inland, and 2011 for aquaculture. And these are available in the public domain for governments to use or certification schemes to use. Some of the certification, private certification schemes have used our guidelines and actually on their website state that they are in compliance with the guidelines but there's no way to check that because we are not mandated to verify if they are in compliance with our guidelines. FAO also conducted some studies of echo labels because we have three pillars in FAO. <clears throat> we collect data and do research. 
and we promote dialogue among our member countries and we also do capacity building. So we conducted some studies on echo labels and found that they had these common features um, that environmentally aware active populations, which you can imagine in the countries that are importing seafood products, a retail sector dominated by large supermarket change rather than people going into the fish market and buying their fish directly from the fishermen, uh, consumption patterns where there's a few main species that people are consuming, and a preference for processed products that are easy to prepare. You can imagine this is in industrialized countries, not in developing countries. So the demand for echo labels is primarily in industrialized country markets. There's been another development in the market for seafood certification, and that was primarily driven not by governments, but by private companies. 32 companies in 2013 joined with the German government, two NGOs, and the FAO to try and develop a global benchmarking tool based on the FAO guidelines so that independent auditors could assess these schemes and see if they are in compliance with the guidelines and which ones you know, have which compliance to which features. So this initiative followed on the global food safety initiative, which has been operating for 10 years to help quality assurance in food, exports and imports. And they're hoping that this will bring transparency and clarity to the seafood market and actually increase demand for seafood by consumers, but responsibly supports, uh, sourced supply, not um, illegal fishing. So this is the latest development. There's also been a development um, private initiative again, and that's the uh, ISO organization is currently discussing development of a marine standard for certification schemes, and that should be on the market uh, if, it's, if it uh, flies in three years. So that's another private sector initiative. Finally, there's a major concern about these fisheries echo labels in the ability of developing country fisheries and aquaculture producers to meet the requirements of private certification schemes because they are designed primarily around industrial fisheries in developed countries with strong government and research institutions that developing countries just don't have. To assist developing country fisheries, fisheries improvement projects have been piloted for various fisheries in developing countries with the aim to raise the level of fisheries management and thus increase availability of sustainably sourced products for international markets, and Ecolabels could help in that area, and many are participating in FIPS. Other developing country fisheries have obtained Ecolabeling through private investment or cooperating with existing certification schemes to develop their own uh, locally developed schemes for, quite often this is for aquaculture, cluster certification, or for small capture fisheries like mussels. There is room still, though, for significantly more support from private sector enterprises, the donor community, and other stakeholders to promote sustainable management practices in developing country fisheries, especially the small-scale sector. And finally, in conclusion, the efforts of civil society and private sector stakeholders through market-based measures, namely echo labels of marine capture fisheries, has promoted improved traceability of fish from responsibly managed fisheries and aquaculture producers, although at the same time raising auditing costs and further complicating international market for fish and fishery products, which have already quite complicated value chains. In addition, the growing evolution of public certification schemes. National governments now are starting to develop their own certification schemes may lead to increased trade disputes between countries as echo labels cross the line between a voluntary business-to-business -business transaction, which is what they are now, into the realm of technical standards, which we've already seen fall under the agreements of the World Trade Organization. And then that will now become an issue for the WTO. Thank you very much. Great. Your voice held out magnificently. <laughs> there you go. Um, the, your benchmarking tool was a real take home that 
this thing of bringing the ones together and figuring out what the common points are, and it's something that may be useful. You have copies of it. Okay, good. And that may be very useful in other sectors. Our next speaker, Kellen, you want to go ahead and stand up here? Welcome to sit or stand, whichever you're comfortable. And um, I'll walk over with you and then come back. Um, so we've now looked at fisheries from a very big perspective, a big sector that's species-focused. And Calvin is a private sector chap here running conservation as a business in Kenya, and he's more at the landscape level than at, at, than at the species level, if you will, looking at landscape conservation. So over to you. Thank you, Francis. <clears throat> I also have a voice issue, so I'll try to keep the mic close as well. Um, yeah, I run a small camp uh, with my senior partner, my wife, of course, um, in the Mara, Masai Mara, uh, in Kenya. Uh, we are a 100-year-old business and always trying to find a way to stay relevant in the business. And we don't have a lot of money in huge investments, so we do it in other ways. Uh, one thing we have done is try to join organizations like the GER, Global Ecosystem Retreats, of the long run, uh, Masa Mara Wildlife Conservancies Association, and various other organizations that will give us some credibility and information to do better. So the business case, oh, sorry. That's me. <laughs> So the business case uh, to, uh, to do these sort of things is basically uh, to promote resource efficiencies, to come together and create organizations that you know, would get economies of scale, central databases, um, and information flow. Uh, number two is strengthen differentiation and respond to an increasingly aware market. The market is changing out there, um, but it is... Uh, it's very, uh, it's very hard to tell who is real, who is really green. Uh, to also, to help secure the foundation of the business, which is land, resource-based nature and wilderness. Land, land, land. There's no wildlife without land. So, however, the business case is not straightforward. Differentiation is still very low between greenwashing and genuine sustainability. Uh, informed market still a very niche market. Uh, it requires financial capacity and strong commitments for the long term rather than short term profit. I mean, we're looking 20 years ahead by joining the GER. Uh, tour operators make decisions based on costs and short term gains. They're driven by commissions. <laughs> they do not value sustainability enough to prefer sustainable tourism businesses themselves. So we, the industry, the, the products have to we have to create the demand in the end client to force the, the supply chain to shift. And this is painful for us. It's, it's long, hard, and expensive. So even more difficult in developing countries. An inadequate policy framework. Of course, in a country like Kenya, it's about food production. You know, it's not about tourism. It's not about landscape conservation. Uh, laws are weak, as is governance. Thus, non-compliant tourism operators have a competitive advantage. Um, so where does your conservation fee actually go when you pay it in a park or a reserve? How does it actually help wildlife? Is it captured by the government where maybe it builds a school, but there's no connection with wildlife, for example? OK, governments do not always invest sufficiently in their wilderness areas. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've just got into this. Yeah, that's it. Got it. Uh, governments do not always invest sufficiently in their wilderness areas, resulting in poor management, thus affecting tourism businesses despite high investment. The private sector is willing to invest strongly into protecting wilderness areas, however, Government does not uh, does only not support does not only not support but penalizes businesses for their efforts. For example, we'll secure large areas for conservancies, but we still have to pay high taxes. Well, we're actually doing a government service by securing wildlife on that land. It should be the other way around, clearly. 
uh, free riding is promoted rather than discouraged. So what is free riding? Free riding is basically, yeah, you, you can build a lodge in the Mara Reserve. It's probably not by plan, but you manage to get yourself in there. And uh, your money for conservancy fees doesn't actually secure wildlife because that land is safe anyway. It's never going to be degazetted and turned to maize. It's secure. So tourism money should be outside, outside of the parks and reserves. The context is high risk and investment as a sustainable tourism operation is higher. So the primary driver to comply to adhere to voluntary sustainable tourism certifications is not short term business returns. <clears throat> so other challenges, lack of supportive infrastructure and sustainable supply chain. Competitive, eco-friendly products are not always available locally or even nationally. A proper waste disposal facilities and recycling options are limited, if not, if not inexistent. Transport costs are extremely prohibitive. Uh, understanding of the tourism business, let alone sustainability, is often lacking among staff, thus requires time and investment. I mean, staff come from local areas, which have a different driver. They, don't, they also don't mind throwing plastic bottles out of the car. <laughs> at home, they would do that, so why would they do it differently at my place? So there's a lot of investment in that training. In developing countries, genuinely sustainable tourism operators often have to develop the capacity of the supply chain, create and innovate with regards to waste management. This takes dedication, time, skills, financial resources. So the long run, the long run is a worldwide organization with uh, 10 core global ecosphere retreat status properties. 28 long-run fellows and 60 long-run supporters. Uh, it is growing rapidly and we need to grow it four times the size in the next five years. So how can organizations like the Long Run support sustainable tourism operations to keep doing the right thing? Uh, creating networks and business associations around the world will help members have a voice locally and internationally supporting increasing understanding of what genuine sustainability is and support differentiation. It provides members with the energy to carry on, to provide them with recognition and continuous encouragement, to share experience, technical expertise, enabling cross-pollination amongst members and ensuring solutions are disseminated and boosting knowledge transfer. A voice in the conservation arena, ultimately influencing policy. I mean, here I am, talking to a very large crowd. <laughs> so the long run, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's probably, it's probably securing, the long run and its members are probably securing or influencing more land land use around the world than any other private sector group, potentially. You know, uh, five million acres of land directly, 7.6 million indirectly, half a million people are benefiting some way or another, 18,000 species, uh, five million, 5.4 million dollars invested in the four C's. I'll explain the four C's in a minute. June 2014. Uh, yes, it just goes on. We're influencing a lot of land, a lot of people. So on to Cottas, 1920 safari camp. Uh, it's a pretty picture with a statement from a senior company partner, my wife. From being a long run member to being in reach of GER status and beyond is a journey of continuous improvement on the path of excellence in sustainability. And it is a process that Cotter's 1920s camp has found incredibly constructive and beneficial in its journey and approach towards long-term sustainability. 
But a few more insights on the Cotter's experience. <coughs> we have a 4C framework we work within. Community, culture, commerce, and conservation. The 4C framework is a set of targets and goals for each of those Cs which need to be achieved and built on. This process takes years, but it is we set our own goals in each of those four Cs, and we have to achieve the next level. By the time the experts come and vet us, it can be a half a year later or a year later. Um, and we, to maintain GER status, we have to continue to achieve and improve. So the standard is based on progress, not ticking boxes. It relies on minimum being achieved destinations setting their own goals and meeting them. What have we done? Well, we've expanded entirely our solar system, sustainability monitoring, we employ someone for that, just that alone, because it's all, all based on information and monitoring. Um, improved our waste disposal, disposal systems. Uh, this conservancy, we're, we're looking at doubling the conservancy over the next couple of years. Uh, basically, just in every sphere of our operations, we've changed. So being part of the long run as a center of excellence is recognizing that this is a continuous journey, no tick boxing, tick boxing exercise. And we do regular conference calls with all the members. Um, at least once a month, we're talking about a subject where we all get into a group conference and we exchange information to help ourselves. Our business case, membership costs are pro rata on turnover and capped. However, we feel the industry has to become more sustainable. The long run provides an avenue to raise awareness. We are the early adapters, which ultimately will give us a competitive advantage and wilderness to rely on. What we need is more people to join the movement. Up to 70% of wildlife is outside national parks in Kenya, and we need the private sector to pull together to create more conservancies, to create more land, and that is our main driver at Cotters. And that is actually, that is actually it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you. Uh, okay, as, as often happens in these, the first two speakers get spend a bit more time, and the last three speakers have to think about question and answer, so they have to speed up a little bit, but there we go. Now that's always the way we have it with panels. The, um, the interesting thing for this topic is that this, what um, Calvin was talking about is sustainability of a service, not just the sustainability of a commodity. And many people in the conservation industry think that tourism is a solution to the wildlife crisis in Africa. Tourism has its own challenges as we just heard. It's very challenging to figure out how to do tourism properly and sustainably and how to export that and so on. And so this is a very good example of that. The other thing you mentioned was the four C's, conservation, commerce, community, and culture, which is maybe not exactly the same four C's as George's, but George works a certification scheme with the same name, so you may have to talk about branding here. Uh, which is the 4C Coffee Association. So would you like to, you're going to talk a bit about um, 4C and also in the context of ICO, I believe. You'll explain that. Okay, good. George. So we have two 4Cs. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Um, so uh, I'm George Watene from the 4C Association. I'll define what the 4Cs are, our 4Cs. So in uh, this afternoon talk, I'll just touch on a few issues. One is introduce the ICIL Alliance, uh, which 4C is a member of. Then uh, talk, talk a bit about um, the 4C. And then last but not least, also talk about you know, how we handle challenges uh, that uh, producers face when trying to comply with a standard like ours, the 4Cs. So quickly, uh, the ICIL Alliance. The ICIL Alliance is a global association of sustainability standards, and their mission is actually to strengthen sustainability standard systems in terms of uh, looking at the benefits towards the environment and also the benefit uh, towards people. Uh, the ICIL Alliance was established way back in 2002. It has a large number of standards that are members 
I'm sure you've noticed some of that logos from some of uh, the previous speakers' uh, uh, presentations. You've seen the Marine Stewardship uh, Council logo there. These are the members of the 4C, and today that we are talking, uh, uh, these are the members of ISIL Alliance, and today that we are talking about natural resources, uh, many of the experts in this room might recognize maybe the Forest Stewardship Council and the Marine Stewardship Council, among others. So, um, the, the ISIL has four goals, uh, which relate to one, of course, trying to improve the impacts of standards, two, also trying to improve the effectiveness of these voluntary uh, sustainability standards that are part of its membership, also try to increase the uptake of um, these voluntary standards, and uh, credible, and when we say credible, we also have to define what credibility is. So then one of the other goals of the ICL Alliance is then to try and define you know, credibility for sustainability standards. And uh, to me, these goals, there are a couple of ways and uh, means that are put, and some of the key means that might be important uh, for this, this evening is the codes of good practice that ICL has uh, that full members have to comply with. And case in point, the standard setting code, which tries to ensure that you know the standards are set in a way that they are local applicable, but also globally consistent. Two, that they also have are open to stakeholder consultation. And then three, that they are freely available, and so on. And then the impacts code tries also to ensure that the different standards that are members that are also able to communicate about the change they're having on the ground in a consistent way. And last but not least, the assurance code tries to ensure that uh, when these standards are checked for compliance on the ground, then that is a best practice on how these standards are checked. So that's a bit about uh, the ICL Alliance. Uh, then we come to the four Cs. So you just had four Cs. We thought we had uh, the trade mark for the four Cs, but we've just realized uh, other people use the four Cs too. So the four Cs that we are talking about here is uh, the Cs stood for the common code for the coffee community. <laughs> so I don't know which Cs you'll take, but I, I, would, I would rather you take the, the latest one. <laughs> so uh, the four C association is a membership association whose aim um, is to unite relevant coffee stakeholders in working towards improvement of uh, the socio, environmental, and economic conditions of coffee production and processing. And all these to try and ensure a thriving, but also a sustainable sector for generations to come. Uh, FOSI, like I said, is a membership association. And uh, I'm sure you might notice some of those logos if you're a relevant coffee stakeholder. Please note, <laughs> and a relevant coffee stakeholder also stands for those that drink coffee. Uh, and I'm sure many of you may be heard that just before. So uh, the Fossey Association members uh, are tri a part, we have a tripartite chamber whereby we have the producers, and we are talking about producers all the way from Vietnam to Colombia and anything in between along the tropics. And then we have trade and industry, and this relates to people, for instance, importers, exporters, traders in coffee, but also roasters and retailers. And then we have the civil society. I mean, we had the talk about you know, some of these standards being driven by civil society. So we also have civil society membership. And unique for us is also that uh, this, the non-governmental, non, um, and the non-profit organizations that also relate to coffee, for instance, uh, the Rainforest Alliance, Fair Trade International, and Oats Certified are also members of the 4C Association. Then we have another chamber, but we say we are three chamber, but we have another chamber for the guys that we cannot fit in the uh, three areas. And these are in relation to other stakeholders that are not directly involved in the coffee chain. And here we come from all the way from government ministries like the German BMZ, banks like you know AB and AMRO and Rabobank, uh, regional and national coffee institute organizations like the European Coffee Federation and the African Fine Coffees Association. So this is the particular membership. And then when we are talking about the community that has the common code, then this is the community we are talking about. And at the time of the development of the code, the community involved about 80% of the industry, so in terms of either production or in terms of trade and so on. 
Uh, then what are the challenges uh, that we or developing countries face in relation to like working with a code like ours? So for instance, those of you that have just uh, been following Paris uh, last week, or for instance, were there, uh, then we have issues like you know rising temperatures, drought, and unpredictable rain patterns. You know we have uh, increase in frequency of coffee diseases, isolated smallholders uh, with, of course, without access to training or financial uh, services. Then the other part is, of course, aging uh, farmers. And of course, with age, then it also means that the knowledge also gets older and older. And um, other parts are in relation to the volatile uh, prices being a commodity and also limited support uh, in many producing country uh, from uh, the governments themselves. So these are part of the challenges that we face. So then how do we ensure that uh, producers or people uh, in developing countries, which um, by, I don't know, by choice or by default, happens to be part of the areas where most of the coffee producing countries are in. So uh, as a 4 c the challenge, of course, is to reach out and impact uh, on as many coffee farmers as possible. The numbers out there are about 25 million uh, coffee farmers. And uh, I must say, we've started, but there's still a long way to go. We're still at the million, so we have 24 more to go. And in terms of this, so how do we reach out to these? And we've realized, and uh, being one of the commodities that has been heavily involved in the topic of sus uh, sustainability for much longer than many, uh, we are proud of that as coffee. But we also saw in one of the graphs, we are about like the second uh, heavily traded uh, commodity, uh, food commodity in the world. So on these, how then do we ensure that we deal with those challenges and reach out to more and more people with this uh, baseline code? So at the 4C, we look at these in three different ways. One is collaboration as a collaborative platform. 10 plus years has shown us that people cannot do it alone. So we bring uh, private and public stakeholders together in agreeing on a common agenda, agreeing on common priorities, but also sharing the responsibilities. Then uh, the other part, of course, is promoting a baseline um, code, which is a common reference in order to ensure that, of course, majority of the farmers at least reach this reference, but not stopping there. Last but not least, we also encourage competition on performance to drive even greater sustainability. And for these, we are talking of a performance framework where then we have agreed KPIs that then uh, people compete on. But we ensure that everyone is at the baseline and we try to make that pre-competitive. And then after that, then everyone races to the top and uh, for the benefit of uh, the world and at large. So on these ones, just to give an example of you know how we've dealt with some of these challenges in the past, and like I said, collaboration is key. Uh, one of the challenges we had is that as a baseline code, one of the requirements is like that any pesticide that gets either is highly hazardous or that is banned internationally then uh, people that are part of the association or, or farmers that comply with the code, then uh, you know get rid of that particular pesticide. And one case in point uh, that we had in 2011 is a pesticide that was not banned yet, that then got banned and people were using, and case in point, uh, endosulfan. So, the, so we had to come up with a project then, because then what that meant is that in one year, a majority of countries that were still using uh, endosulfan for a very bad uh, pest that is called the coffee berry borer. And if it attacks, then you don't get the nice coffee. I hope it was nice, the coffee that you had on your coffee break. If it attacks that, then the quality of that coffee is really uh, affected. So then this was a case in point where a majority, or I, I wouldn't say majority, or a large part of producers or some countries were still using that since it was not banned. But then it gets banned and it needs to be phased out within a year and so forth. So here we are at a point where we have people that comply or are, that are in the process of complying that are using something that all of a sudden the goalpost changes and we say, sorry, uh, we are moving in that direction. So we had phased out challenges when endosulfan was uh, put in the list of persistent organic pollutants in the Stockholm Convention. And then facing out challenges in several coffee producing countries that were still using endosulfan. So for these, uh, we, we had with partners, and I list the partners down there. The project was, of course, led by one of our members, the Pesticide Action Network of the UK, 
and the 4C Association, but with funding partners from the Sustainable uh, Coffee Program of the uh, Sustainable um, Trade Initiative, IDH, the ICIL Alliance, and then also funds from FAO that were directed to the Pesticide Action Network with contributing partners of other standards that were also affected. But also at the bottom there, you see the International Coffee Organization, which is the intergovernmental organization of coffee producing and exporting countries. So these came together to try and see then how do we drive and ensure that farmers then comply with the standard. And uh, they looked at issues of then uh, finding out and documenting countries that do not use endosulfan and then passing this knowledge to people that had the challenges. So for us, uh, as a close, we have learned that the way to get more and more developing uh, country farmers to comply is one, collaborate, but two, also innovate. You know, some problems need new solutions, and three, invest. So you have uh, companies committing, you know, to buying coffee that meets that particular standard, and of late, our numbers are, for instance, nine million bags which is close to about 10% of the global coffee consumption uh, being bought by companies as compliant. And last but not least, of course, then empowering. And this is empowering the producers who then have to meet those particular challenges. Uh, thank you very much. And um, we invite you all, you know, for a cup of coffee, but not only a cup of coffee, but also joining the association in pushing this agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. It's most interesting. So we have two wonderful four C's at, at, at the table. Mike, the, oh, we lost the, we need the beeper. Where did the beeper go? The flicker. Um, so we've got two more quick presentations. Hang in there, and then we'll have a few minutes for discussion. We started a few minutes late, so we'll go over a few minutes, um, but not so much that we, we conflict with the next one. Um, we've just went from a two, we've had two of the, the two largest, according to Victoria's commodity chains out there, coffee and, and fisheries. Um, in getting now closer to Calvin's world, Mike has been involved with the trying to figure out how we would start to look at criteria for sustainability in the wildlife trade. And um, I don't think there's a lot to learn here, but we're not, we haven't got to where these folks are yet in this section, I think. Oh, you got to be there. Thanks, Frank. Okay, so um, I'm going to be looking at a framework for sustainable wild trade standards. Um, what do I mean by sustainable wild trade? Well, this would be trade that meets species conservation objectives, both for species themselves and for the ecosystems in which they survive. So it would maintain the genetic um, and, fun and the functional integrity of the species as well as the ecosystems in which they live. But there's also a social sustainability component that we need to look at. Um, so we need to look at wild trade in species in the context of the socioeconomic environments in which they survive. And that's all part of what defines sustainability. So um, why, do we, why, do, why have we set up this framework? Well, the idea is that um, this will help us uh, to, desi to design new um, uh, standards as well as evaluate existing standards. Um, and we've picked up lessons from assist, assessed case studies over the last few decades. Following the Brundtland report in the 1990s, the uh, WWF did a substantial amount of work, which they produced in that book, Wild Species as Commodities. That was fo then followed up with further case study work in the, in the early 2000s, um, and most recently a, a report which is released. Um, it was a joint venture between the International Trade Center and the IUCN Sustainable Use and Livelihoods Group, and I was involved in this report, which then generated this framework that I'm going to discuss now. So the analytical framework breaks down four types of factors which would then determine whether trade might be sustainable or not. And these factors are at the species level, they're governance factors, supply chain factors, and end market factors. So at the species level, um, the first thing you'd look at is the actual species resilience to harvest. And this would be determined by two things. It would be um, affected by biological factors, which are the innate characteristics of the species, how fast does it grow, how sensitive is it, and so on. And also non-biological factors, uh, such as what, what methods of harvesting are available. Is it possible to harvest non-lethally? 
or must harvest necessarily be lethal, and so on. Uh, another important issue is accessibility. Um, how accessible is the species to communities? Um, is it possible to, to produce them intensively or to farm them, or must they be harvested from the wild? Then looking at governance factors, um, a key component of any, of any government's uh, framework will be property rights. Um, and the first question to ask is what type of property rights exist over the species in question or the, the population in question? Uh, are they public property? Are they communally owned? Are they privately owned? What type of, uh, and that will strongly influence the incentives of the uh, people either harvesting or managing the resource. And then the question, are they, are they strong? Are the property rights, can they be defined as strong rights or weak rights? Uh, weak rights would be an open access resource, a free for all, the well-known tragedy of the commons. Strong rights are well-defined and vested in individuals that can actually enforce the rights and protect them. Then we have policy settings. Uh, some, subjects, uh, some species will be subject to heavy regulation or even bans. Um, in other cases, there might be enabling legislation. It's really important to look at that. And then obviously the role of CITES in all of this is, is, is fundamentally important as CITES provides the international framework under which all this falls. And then there's a broader governance context uh, of which the whole trade environment is, is, is a significant part and where we need to look at institutions, whether they are actually harmonized, whether they're actually working together, or whether they're in conflict, both uh, 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 within a level and between different levels. And do informal institutions match to formal institutions uh, from the local level to the regional to um, inter inter international levels? Then there are supply chain factors. Um, and we need to look at, from, at the production level, we look, need to look at costs and scale. Um, whether uh, sustainable management is actually affordable or not to local people, and if it in fact is the most effective form of land use. Um, a really important issue is stockpiling. There are certain uh, wild resources that can be stockpiled, for example, elephant ivory, rhino horn. Uh, this, there are pros and cons involved if, if stockpiling is a possibility. The pros being that stockpiling can be used as a tool to smooth out uh, va variations in demand over time. Uh, a con being that um, if the incentive, there might be incentives to illegally stockpile and build up stocks uh, if, for example, the uh, species are considered to be going extinct and the, the whole banking on extinction argument, which might be driving, for example, the stockpiling of rhino horn and ivory. Then there's the role of communities. Um, how well are the communities structured in the supply chain? Do they have producer cooperatives? Are they empowered? And this plays into the next question, which is what is the concentration of market power along the supply chain? And again, there are, there are pros and cons. Um, resource economics theory tells us that uh, a monopoly is actually beneficial if it's at the supplier level because a monopolist will harvest more slowly. And then finally, we have end market factors. Uh, market size is critically important, and it's a function of both uh, the price of the products. You can have a relatively small market, but if it's a high-value market, it still could drive trade in a certain direction, and then the volume factors. Then there's demand elasticity, which is really important, which is the sensitivity to changes in price, and that can also have a profound influence on how policy, how well policy could work. If you've got highly inelastic demand, which is not responsive to changes in price, it, for example, can respond very negatively to something like a trade ban in that it only expands the size of the market by driving up its value. Um, then consumer preferences are really important and need to be looked at closely. Do consumers prefer the genuine product to a synthetic product? Is there scope for substitution? Uh, do consumers prefer wild products over farm products? Do they prefer rare products over abundant products? Is there a scarcity premium? Um, and do they prefer legal trade over illegal trade, which will also determine how well certification can work? And then you need to look at how consumer preferences might shift over time. So what are the implications for standards and certification? Well, I, I, I believe there are a number of opportunities here. There are opportunities to expand beyond the existing IUCN Red List and CITES trade monitoring criteria. The, the, the um, past approaches have been fairly narrow. The, the Red List just looks at how threatened the, the species is. It, it, it generally ignores a lot of these other institutional factors. And CITES tends to monitor trade volumes, but doesn't look for those other qualitative criteria that I mentioned before. 
So there's an opportunity to develop more inclusive sustainability criteria, including socioeconomic and governance factors. Um, there are definitely opportunities to improve monitoring and measurement. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these things are unrecorded and unreported. Um, and there's an opportunity to strive for transparency generally. Um, and then very desirable to harmonize existing standards, but this then leads us into a challenge, which is integrating developed and developing country priorities, which may differ greatly. And just as a classic example, developed countries care a lot about, for example, animal welfare standards, animal rights issues. They're a far lower priority in developing countries. Also in implications. Vita, you get to wrap this up. Yes, thank you. I'm happy it's you and not me for the last speaker. It's tough. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in a way, it's nice um, to be the last speaker because I can wrap up and refer to all the others. In a way, it's sad because you're already tired and exhausted and longing for coffee. Um, but I try to keep you awake. <laughs> what I did is um, try to formulate some thesis to give you an idea of what I think uh, where we are going to. What do I have to push here? <laughs> Did that one? On the white. Mm, yeah, wonderful. You already prearranged everything wonderfully. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm speaking about the link between um, voluntary standards and public policy and also especially about trade and aid because these are the most important sectors in that regard. Where do we stand? A confusing number of standards facilitates a race to the bottom. I mean, that sounds very negative, um, but there's a big danger. Um, voluntary standards are the consequence of a policy failure. I think that's the starting point. Huh? We do have voluntary standards because international policies and national policies did not follow up enough on our adequ adequately on ecological and social sustainability issues. So what happened is private action tried to fill this gap, and that's why we are faced with a large range of private sustainability standards. Um, the other speakers already described it. Um, to give you a number, um, the International Trade Center um, has produced a standards map that tries to give an overview, and they cover more than 170 voluntary private standards. So you see a little bit um, of how much there is already, but also how big the confusion is. And that's very confusing for consumers. I mean, you probably, as consumers, you're aware with that. You go to a shop, you look for sustainable coffee, for example, or fish or whatever, and you find a whole range of standards on the backside or somewhere in the internet, and you're not really aware of what's the difference because these standards are all different. And that's even more, that makes things even more complicated. Now today, standards penetrated mainstream markets. In the beginning, that was niche markets. But today, for example, standard compliant coffee is about 40% of global, global production, 40%. And large chocolate producers like Mars and Ferrero committed, are committed to source 100% of their cocoa from sustainable sources by two, 2020. So they really have to push for large amounts. And the point is, if you push for large amounts and you want to, to really cover this, this, big, um, this big amounts, there is a big danger that the standard, the value of the standard, let's say, decreases. And that is why I said there is a danger of a race to the bottom. Production, the, the, the last problem is um, there is no automatic pro development outcome. Production of certified products is mostly located in advanced export oriented economies. In developing countries, that is Latin, Latin America, then Asia, but in standards which are also covering products that are produced in industrialized countries like forestry, it's them who dominate the market. So the pro-development outcome is not automatic. And I think George described very well um, the challenge that is there for small and poor producers to really comply um, with that, what the standards demand. 
Public policy objectives, my next thesis, support voluntary sustainability standards is fine, but not too much binding regulation, please. Public policy is very much involved in these standards. I mean, even if they are called voluntary sustainability standards, mostly they depend very much on aid money, on money from donors. The interest of the of, of public of policy is um, to influence sustainability, to influence sustainable consumer, but also investor behavior. Um, but usually, what is done is the promotion of the voluntary standards, and that is also linked because we have to do with a global value chain. A national government can do a lot to implement sustainability within its own country, but cannot do a lot to implement sustainability in other countries. So that's why you need incentives, and that is the interest of um, environmental policy, but also social. We made an evaluation of the impact of voluntary standards, and one of the outcomes which I found very interesting at that time was that the, the evaluators told us there was an impact on the awareness of the social standards issue in China, and that came from the dialogue that was around our sustainability projects that we did, or projects on voluntary sustainability standards. Transparency, information, knowledge transfer, and dissemination, these are very important objectives um, that public policy is following. You heard about, I already mentioned the ITC standards map, you heard about ICEAL, um, you heard about the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative, Victoria was speaking about that. These are all instruments to create um, transparency and more information for producers and consumers. And for benchmarking, that's to make comparable um, different standards. Uh, in the beginning I said it's so difficult for consumers to see what's the difference between these standards, but that it's also difficult for producers. And that's why you need this kind of information and websites that show, makes easier access um, to show what's the difference between these things, what is, that, what is maybe needed in your specific context as a consumer or as a producer. Improving quality is another objective, public policy objective. Um, for example, in Germany, and there has been developed a website that is doing something like an application and quality check on the basis of the defined criteria that consumers can, can use. Yeah, the problem is always, um, we have voluntary standards on the one hand, but as I said, they are addressing a policy failure. So at the same time, we'd have to travel. I already told you that most, many of these initiatives um, are supported by donor money um, for, with different objectives. Um, first, there is the pro-development impact of standards. Um, George has described how difficult it is for small producers to comply with standards, and that is something that donors can support with Aid for Trade. Or support to quality, quality infrastructure is another issue. Very important, the convening role and experience that governments have with stakeholder participation. For C, it wouldn't have come about without the support in the beginning of the German government and later also of the Dutch government. And why? Because coffee producers or coffee retailers, the big chains, at the time they were aware that there is a quality problem that has to, be to do with sustainability, but they did not really know whom to approach, with whom to discuss it. And that's why um, development policy had an important convening role. Knowledge on impact today is, of course, very important. I've been told to be quick, so I try my best. Um, maybe with regard to the role of international and trade policy, there is not a lot so far. Um, I think Victoria gave a very good example with the FAO guidelines, which are there, negotiated, but they are voluntary. Nobody is forced to stick to them. We have something in WTO SPS, um, which is dealing with private standards. It's about information and cooperation, etc. But there is nothing really substantial. And the thing that would be demanded by Michael, um, common definitions and reporting, something that is really applied to everybody at the moment is not there. 
So that's something that still has to be discussed. In trade policy, I gave you two examples. Um, standards are in increasingly introduced in trade policy, but that's partly with a reference to corporate so social responsibility that, and partly a reference to voluntary standards. Enforceable inclusion of standards is sometimes there, as in these two examples I gave you. Something I want to say, it's only two sentences, which I think is very important, but is at the moment not on the table, is to include private voluntary standards in the generalized systems of trade preferences. You know, all industrialized countries give trade preferences. That means um, tariffs are reduced for products from developing countries. And I would suggest that these tariffs should be more reduced for products complying with certified products according to, of course, predefined criteria. So let me close um, just with, the, with reminding you again, voluntary standards, I think, can play a very helpful role, but they are second best. First best would be really international agreement on binding regulation on sustainability issues. Thank you. That was brilliant. That was absolutely excellent, and it worked very well. So what we did is we went from some real examples in real sectors to Vita now bringing it right back to the, to the world of the World Trade Organization and something that we could sort of think about, which is the role of voluntary standards within the trade regime, within the, the rules of the game, and what role they play. And I think, though, as you said, two things that came away. One is that it's our current system is very complicated. It's, it's all over the place. And secondly, maybe it really isn't about private voluntary standards, it's about public-private voluntary standards because it's a partnership program that these standards all have come out through public-private partnerships, essentially. So even though they're voluntary, there is a role for, for the public sector. We've only got a few minutes because the next folks are going to kick us out. So I'd suggest if we've got a couple questions, let's ask a couple questions here. And then when we wrap up, come and pigeonhole a couple of our speakers one-on-one -on -one and hammer them with some more questions as, as we get thrown out of the room. So any questions to our panel? Yes, sir. This is a quick hello who you are and a quick question. Yeah, hello, James Mello Ferdi. I have just a, one question for Victoria Chomo. Uh, it's quite clear from the Paris meetings that in order to f deal with the climate change issue, we're going to need to have the private sector involved in it. So what some people call uh, private authority, that is standards, which is what you're talking about. So my question to you is, well, given that you're recognizing that there are going to be conflicts with the uh, public authorities. Now, what do you think about the potential role uh, for the WTO in settling uh, these uh, conflicts? And for the second question about the GSP, let's put the GS into the GSP products that, are, uh, that satisfy environmental standards. Well, just think about the EGA, how difficult it's been to try just to define uh, environmental goods. We've been going at it for now, what, 15 years? So, you know, it's a good idea, but it's difficult to implement. The floor to you. One other set of one other question to so take your questions, and we'll end up with the panel responding. Yes. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Derito, and I work for Trademark East Africa. I'm actually working on standards and non-tariff barriers to trade. My question is very generic; could go to anyone, but I would prefer that Miss Evita answers it. I like the fact that you recognize there's a lot of confusion on private standards, because, for instance, we're exporting coffee. There's a standard on, for instance, labor, child labor. Then there is a environmental standards, social standards, and then you have to comply to all of them, including labeling recently on whether on carbon footprints, depending on whether your, your, your produce have, has been fl flown across the world. So what is the best body to come and harmonize all these standards? At least in the public sector, we do have the National Bureaus of Standards come and sit down and harmonize standards. So that when you adhere to one standard, for instance, in Kenya, then you adhere to all standards in the East African community. Is there anything like that in the international trading regime? Any other? One last question here. Yeah, uh, I'm Benson Kaduri from East African Trade Review. I, I think mine is to, I think to Michael. Uh, the issue, 
I think and uh, Victoria, I believe the whole issue is uh, the people who are actually supposed to adhere to this or to comply are basically surviving. We know right now in Kenya, in Lake Victoria, there's overfishing. But this, this is an activity these people have no alternative. They just go in in the morning, in the evening, fish, clear everything and survive. Also in coffee, I come from a coffee growing area. You want them to, co to comply, yet the prices are so poor. And even some of the buyers who are supposed to actually reduce demand and pay a, a premium price do not do it. So the farmers don't get returns, so they don't care. How do you do it? And yet your members in that uh, can actually create demand and make the whole thing popular. Okay. The, the connection between the two is the complexity is not just on the consumer side, it's on the producer side too and the challenges. It's one tiny little question and then I'll let the folks here give a quick reply and then I'll, we'll get kicked out. Um, just a quick question. Um, I just had a question around what kind of scale of impact we're trying to achieve to sustainability and market-driven standards. Um, just an example from Tanzania, um, there's an avocado project down there and we're trying to achieve sustainability there um, with, uh, with a watershed approach. But really, there's very little chance to achieve overall landscape or watershed sustainability there without engaging the various other sectors. Um, and so my question is, how can we achieve a clustered approach to standards, how, how can we get the four C's talking to the four C? That's a good question. Okay, okay so we've only got a few minutes. Um, I'm pushing this back on. Um, George, okay, you have the floor, but you have a quick floor, and then pass it on. A couple comments you may have in response to the, the questions we have from our Okay, just, just a quick one uh, to Eliza. Uh, she asked about, you know, harmonization, uh, harmonization and such. Uh, one of the things we do, as, especially for 4C, which is a baseline code, is we have benchmarking. So, for instance, for farmers that already meet another code like fair trade and so on, then they do not have to go through the complexities of then, you know, going through anything to achieve access to a market of 4C. Uh, but we do that for members, uh, member standards that are members of the 4C Association. And then to Kathuri, where he asked about, you know, how do the list of logos that we've shown of some of our buyers then push uh, the ability of then the farmers to access that and maybe make a bit more money. I uh, will give you examples uh, in terms of, like, for instance, when some of our members then require uh, in, in, uh, implementation of the standard. We've also had them actually not only committing, but also investing uh, in many of these producers so that they reach and they access that market, but also that they make a bit more money. And driving, yesterday I was driving towards Nyeri and I had all these uh, three cooperatives on the way that had big logos, you know, saying uh, Nescafe plan, you know, for a better coffee life or something. And that's just examples of places where one of our members has invested in their bid, of course, then to increase the, 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 the amount of coffee that then reaches that particular level. Thank you. I maybe may only come back to my GSP issue. And that the good thing about the generalized system of trade preferences is that it does not need to be negotiated multilaterally because these are unilateral trade preferences. So the USA or Japan or Australia or the EU or others who are giving preferences, granting preferences, they can decide alone about the criteria that has to be applied. Things like that are already done. No? The EU has a it's called GSP Plus um, that gives additional preferences to countries that follow international convention. Um, or the flag system that is applied by the EU is, ba is working also on certification systems. So there are, there are examples that, that can be used and the good thing is that's nothing that would, to be, would have to be dealt with in the WTO. I can see the next workshop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> tourism is a good case of <clears throat> the, the producers having no no capacity to to get the money. And uh, in Kenya, for example, less than 0.1 percent of tourism gross re revenue gets to landowners. Ah, oh, so where does the money go? Uh, it's all about getting the money down. And through the GER, with very very high standards, we are starting to get clientele. 
because of those high standards. So in the absence of a general standard, this group is going forward and making its own very high standard and creating uh, revenue for, la for landowners as well as the business. Okay, I had two very good questions, and let's hope my voice holds out. <clears throat> the first question about the WTO and dispute settlement, yes, we think with the increase in the number of national schemes, there's more work for us because we've actually had countries come to us and ask us for capacity building and how to develop national uh, voluntary schemes, but you know, they're not really voluntary, they're national. Um, and we've seen recently in the U.S.-Mexico case, the tuna dolphin, Dolphin Safe Label, that WTO cited against the U.S. and said that that was a technical standard, not a voluntary standard. And when I talked to the, um, the lawyers who were involved in that case, um, I think ICTSD had um, a dispute uh, event discussing that case at the WTO. They said, yes, if there's more national schemes coming online, there will be opportunity for more cases at WTO because it's stepping over the line <clears throat> between technical standard and voluntary standard, private standard. The second question, very relevant. Um, we know that in Africa, quite often, fisheries is an occupation of last resort when drought kills off livestock. I mean, that's been a common theme for, for, for eons. And the issue is, it's really up to governance to develop sectors sustainably and find a way to have food security while at the same time have economic growth and development. And I, I'm sorry to put in a plug for this, but there's a session tomorrow afternoon. FAO is organizing on the State of Commodity Markets 2015, which is our new publication, which looks directly at um, the linkages between food security and trade policy and governance. And if you come to that session, uh, you'll learn more about how, what governments can do under and also in linking up to WTO agreements. Thank you. Okay. And then the last plug is after the after we close, there's a session on policy coherence on natural resources following this. Thank you, everybody. Let's give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you.